Yeah, yeah. Um, so hi to everyone. Um, I wanted to start uh, before talking directly about the cases um, or the litigation that we had um, in the United States to tell you just a little bit more about the case that we litigated here in Colombia and how it all started and how it all ended up in the United States. Um, back in 2001, uh, the paramilitary groups in Colombia were at um, one of the worst uh, case, the, the worst periods in our history was the period between 98 and 2006. Um, it's a period where most of the massacres occurred, um, dozens of extrajudicial executions, and millions of displaced, uh, forcibly displaced persons, and thousands and thousands of executions and, uh, and forced disappearances were uh, occurring all over the country. Um, one of the biggest groups that um, acted in Colombia was uh, what's called the BCB, which is the Central, the Central Bolivar Bloc, part of the AUC, which is the auto, um, uh, the paramilitary group that um, acted as uh, head of all the paramilitary groups in Colombia. And the BCB was located in the center of Colombia in a region called Magdalena Medio, the middle Magdalena. This region has always been grounds for dispute between uh, not only armed groups, but also um, a lot of political and economic interests because it holds one of the main cities, which is Barranca Bermeja, holds uh, the biggest oil port in the country and is where the Colombian oil company is located, but it's also one of the biggest routes for uh, drug trafficking and cocaine trafficking out of Colombia, because it leads from the center of the country out into the coast. So by 2001, um, we had a program that was called the um, Magdalena Medio, the Middle Magdalena Development Program, which is led by a Jesuit priest, Father Daru, who's currently the president of the, the Tr Colombian Truth Commission, and he was working in um, working with a lot of local leaders in trying to establish development pro projects to help communities out of the conflict, to prevent and force recruitment, to prevent young kids from joining different armed groups, the guerrillas, the paramilitaries, or even the military. And this program was at, was being established all throughout the, the Middle Magdalena with local leaders. In 2001, one of the local leaders, um, a lawyer, Alma Rosa Jaramillo was kidnapped and then um, tortured, mutilated, and only her torso was found um, in, a, in Morelos, a city in Magdalena Medio. And uh, apparently she had been kidnapped, tortured, raped, and mutilated by paramilitaries uh, that were part of the BCB. Six months later, Eduardo Estrada, one of the local leaders working with the program, with the development program, was shot uh, on July 16th, 2001. He was shot um, at night walking back home. And at the moment he had been working with the program in trying to establish uh, an area uh, for peace talks to happen in the middle Magdalena. So he was acting as a courier between government um, agents and paramilitaries and guerrillas in order to try to come to an agreement and establish uh, a zone where they could meet to try to have some peace talks. He was also working with the development program and he was also uh, trying to establish a local radio organization um, to promote human rights in the region. This was just two of a group of 24 leaders from the program, from the development program that were assassinated between 2001 and 2003. Um, three of them were forcibly disappeared, just like Alma Rosa. The rest were um, executed by uh, gunmen in the middle of the night. And judicial investigations never really went anywhere. Um, in 2005, uh, the government of Colombia established uh, an agreement with the paramilitaries to demobilize, and they set up what's called the justice and peace process. And the idea was that the paramilitaries that had been part of different paramilitary groups would demobilize, would dearm, and would participate in the judicial proceedings in order to uh, provide justice, truth, and reparations to the victims. They were going to give uh, most of their valuables, uh, assets that they had, and uh, their compromise was that they had to provide uh, justice and truth in order to get a reduced sentence of eight years in prison. The process started in 2006 after the demobilization. However, by 2008, um, a lot of the heads of the paramilitaries had started uh, bringing out or clarifying a lot of the links between the paramilitaries and the Colombian government. And this started to produce serious problems for a lot of the elite uh, in the country, because they were talking, a lot of the leaders were talking about the way that 
the paramilitaries had acted between uh, the beginning of the 90s when they started in 1988 um, up to 2006 when they demobilized had acted not only with the knowledge of Colombian authorities, but in a lot of cases with, uh, in conjunction with Colombian authorities. Um, by this time, the United States had requested the extradition of the heads of the paramilitaries on drug trafficking charges to the US, but the Supreme Court in Colombia had blocked the extradition requests, arguing that first they had to fulfill their obligations under the demobilization agreement in Colombia and provide justice and peace, uh, justice and truth for the victims of uh, enforced disappearances, extrajudicial executions, torture, and basically uh, a, lot of, a wide range of grave human rights violations and breaches of international humanitarian law. However, uh, on May 2008, the Colombian government extradited Carlos Mario Jimenez Macaco to the United States. And uh, three months later, uh, on uh, what's been named as a very uh, obscure operation with the DEA, extradited the remaining 14 heads of the paramilitaries at 5 a.m. in the morning uh, in the middle of uh, July 2008. Um, and it's been called obscure because since while the Supreme Court had blocked the, the request of extradition by, made by the United States government, the Colombian president at the time uh, signed the extradition at 11 p.m. at night, taking into account that the courts were closed and the, all of the justices were asleep called the DA, um, they had planes take out all of the heads of the paramilitaries out of the prisons in Colombia, take, brought back to Bogota where there was a plane, um, a DEA plane waiting for them. And at 6.45, right before everybody, everyone woke up, the plane took off uh, and took uh, 14 heads of the paramilitaries to the United States. Since then, this was 2008, um, this 15 heads of the paramilitaries, Macaco, Carlos Mario Jimenez, and another 14 of them uh, have been prosecuted uh, and char charged, prosecuted, and sentenced on drug trafficking charges in the United States. Macaco himself was convicted in 2011 to 33 years of imprisonment for uh, trafficking cocaine into the United States. However, he was released last year um, after uh, serving a little bit over 10 years um, of his prison sentence. Um, and uh, a lot of the paramilitaries have been released by now. So most of the uh, rulings and the sentences, the convictions that were given that were up to 40, 50 years um, have now been evicted uh, due to either cooperation with the United States government on drug trafficking charges, um, DEA investigations or um, time served. Uh, one of the things that led to the um, alliance between Colombian Commission of Jurists and the CJA in the United States was that the proceedings here in Colombia to investigate assassinations such as the Estrada assassination and the uh, disappearance, torture, and uh, sexual assault on Alma Rosa were not being investigated. The justice and peace process um, after the extradition of the paramilitaries started uh, having a lot of problems in trying to obtain information that could lead to the prosecution of uh, not only the people that actually perpetrated the crimes, but the chain of command. And this was basically uh, a product of the way that the paramilitaries had structured themselves. Um, it was a very hierarchical organization where the gunmen didn't precisely know where the order had come from, and only the people on the top had a lot of the information. But it was also due to the lack of uh, the, the impossibility of being able to even take testimonies from the heads of the paramilitaries in the United States. While the uh, extradition treaty between Colombia and the United States does not establish an obligation for the United States to provide Colombian authorities with any help in Colombian proceedings, um, the Colombian president after extraditing the 14 heads of the paramilitaries had stated that the US government had agreed to allow Colombian uh, DEAs and justices access to the paramilitaries in US courts in order for them to be able to uh, present their testimony, give their own versions and um, keep on complying with their obligations with the Colombian justice and peace process. In practice, this never happened. Macaco was expelled from the justice and peace process in 2015 after he, sorry, in 2012 after um, the conviction in the United States proved that he had continued uh, drug trafficking cocaine outside 
of Colombia into the United States after his demobilization. And that was one of the clauses on the demobilization agreement was that everybody had to stop um, their, all of their operations, including drug trafficking. So since he kept on drug trafficking, he was expelled from the justice and peace process. And after being expelled, he refused to give any statement to Colombian justices or DEAs. And this happened in most of the cases of the paramilitaries that were extradited to the United States. People like Mancuso, who was, uh, is currently the highest ranking member alive of the paramilitaries. He was the second in command to Carlos Castaño, who was, who was the head of the paramilitaries, um, has refused on numerous occasions to give his testimony to Colombian justices. Uh, the US State Department has not been helpful in uh, providing access to the prisons or to mechanisms that could allow Colombian justices and DAs to actually take their statement. And even in cases where the problem has not been at, at State Department level or at US level, it has been a problem through the uh, Colombian Ministry of Just, uh, Foreign Affairs. There are a lot of political and, econ and economical interests that are still alive here in Colombia that do not want these people to testify in Colombia. So there have been requests denied at the level of the DA's office in Colombia, at the level of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Colombia. And then when um, we as victims representatives have managed to overcome those barriers, uh, we encountered problems uh, with the US State Department to the point where in a case we had um, uh, with Don Berna, who is currently in prison in, in Florida, um, we had the, the uh, prison uh, say that they could not bring in a TV so that, well, a TV or a computer so that he could testify through a video conference. Um, so it's been basically, most of the proceedings here in Colombia have been completely stalled after the extradition which uh, most of the uh, victims representative things think that that was the idea of the extradition of the paramilitaries to the United States. And um, so that led in 2014, um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, sorry, 2012, 2013, to the alliance with, uh, with the Center for Justice and Accountability in San Francisco to bring a claim uh, under the TVPA uh, against Macaco for the uh, disappearance and torture of Alma Rosa and the uh, assassination of Eduardo Estrada. Um, I'm gonna let Claret talk about the process in the United States, uh, just to close up. Um, even today, we are still having problems. Macaco was extradited back into Colombia, but since he was expelled from the justice and peace process, um, he's, he now has to be prosecuted uh, under traditional ordinary law. These processes are a lot more um, difficult to bring about, especially after more than uh, 15 years uh, after the facts, 20 years in the case of Eduardo, and especially because Macaco was in the United States for more than uh, 15 years, uh, it's very difficult now to obtain proof um, of uh, his responsibility in the chain of command. Uh, and a lot of the paramilitaries under his command are either dead or are threatened. If they're still alive, they're threatened by the fact that he's still, he's back in Colombia. But um, that hasn't actually been the, the worst part. Um, we are currently facing uh, a very difficult situation with Mancuso, who is currently in the United States. Um, he has time served, and uh, he was um, he hasn't been released. Uh, but uh, the the state said that he had served his time in May this year. And um, what a lot of the paramilitaries did was try to either stay in the United States under the protection of the torture convention, saying that if they were extradited back into Colombia, their lives would be endangered. This happened with um, Javier uh, Alvarez El Tuso Sierra, and he was granted permission to stay in the United States after he served his time for drug trafficking in the United States. So he never actually uh, served any prison time for uh, the human rights violations that he committed in Colombia. And among, in the case of Mancuso, who, as I said before, is was second in command to the head of the paramilitaries, um, because he holds a double nationality with Italy, uh, we have heard that um, the US had granted his request to be extradited or deported to Italy and not extradited back into Colombia, even though the agreement was that after time served, they would come back to Colombia to um, respond to victims in Colombia for the human rights violations they committed here. Um, so that has been uh, the background and the situation here in Colombia, which led to the, C the CSJ seeking CJA um, help in litigating in the United States.
So I'm gonna leave it um, there and pass over to Claret. Thanks so much, Carolina. Um, let me just mark the time so that I mindful of, of the time and I, I'm really eager to hear the questions and answers as well. Um, I thought that uh, I could share uh, my screen and, and share a couple of, of slides just uh, to give you a little bit of background on our work and then kind of move back to the work on Columbia. Um, so I'll do that um, if that's okay. Uh, here we go. All right, I'm gonna rely on others to tell me if they can see the slides. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Um, oops, back, back, back. All right. Um, so the first thing I thought I would do is just give you a sense of what kind, of, what's our, our work at the Center for Justice and Accountability, what TVPA work is. Uh, obviously the TVPA is the Torture Victim Protection Act. Um, there are some fundamental requirements uh, that I think Carolina has touched upon um, for us to be able to bring a TVPA case. There has to be, um, the perpetrator has to be in the United States. Uh, and usually this is for a crime of extrajudicial killing or torture committed abroad. Um, the kind of, uh, I think that the, the, the principle behind this is to ensure that the United States is not a safe haven for torturers and perpetrators of extrajudicial killings. And that was kind of the force behind the establishment of the TVPA. Uh, and it's something that we want to kind of keep true to. Um, I wanted to take you through just a little bit of, of, of the kind of work we do and how we conceive of it. And so I thought the best way to do that is to just take you to just a screenshot of our website, because if you take just the first look at it, a very quick look, you'll notice that we don't think of these cases as cases focused on a specific victim alone. The victim and the crime is often sim a symptom or, 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 or uh, symbolic of a much larger series of violations and of a much larger problem. And so what we try to do is be of assistance in a larger arc of um, work by advocates seeking accountability and ultimately seeking to, to obtain justice, hopefully in the home country, which uh, in our view is the best way to ensure that um, these atrocities do not occur again. Um, and so, you know, I, I'll just, I, I won't take you through these, but if, if you look at them, it, it is not about one crime, just like in this case, our case about um, uh, Alma Rosa Jaramillo and Eduardo Estrada, are not singularly about them, but they are kind of indicative of a much larger swath of crimes and, and atrocities committed in the Middle Magdalena region. So I wanted to, um, sorry, I need to, there we go. I wanted to just kind of take you through what, what we consider when we're, we're thinking about TBPA uh, litigation and what our strategic uh, considerations are. Um, and one of our key considerations is, is what is it that the TVPA litigation can achieve? You know, does it match the goals of the victims and their families? More often than not, I mean, in almost every case, victims really do see themselves and understand, and as well as families, their case as one of many cases. And there's a lot of solidarity for other um, family members and victims. And so our question is often, well, do we, will this case achieve at least part of the goals of the victims, which is more often than not to obtain justice. Yes, there is an element in civil litigation of financial, um, uh, uh, potentially uh, uh, a collection, but that never drives our, our clients. What drives our clients is the fact that they've been denied justice, sometimes for decades, and that they want an opportunity to face the perpetrator of these atrocities in a court and for a court to say, this happened, this was wrong. And that in itself has uh, an effect, a reparatory effect. Um, what do we hope this litigation will yield? Yes, this truth telling, this, this legitimation uh, by a US court of uh, the story of these victims and family members, but also hopefully assist in the larger efforts for accountability that go beyond the victims that we represent. Um, and so that is kind of a key question that we ask ourselves, how does the TVPA and how does our advocacy fit in larger advocacy plans? 
I think I hope that it, it it's obvious already from from what Carolina has has told that um, the case of uh, Eduardo and Alma Rosa fit very well within our paradigm of how we see our impact, um, how we see ourselves having impact. Um, so coordinating litigation and other forms of advocacy, almost always in our cases, our cases do not start and end. And I think this is very key for uh, people who, who are interested in TVPA litigation is that um, human rights advocacy uh, through TVPA litigation does not begin and end with a trial and does not begin and end with a, with a case. Um, it should begin with a deep understanding of the context of the violations in the country and with a development of partnerships on the ground so we can really understand how is this case going to be helpful or is it not going to be helpful? Should we not pursue it? Or should we pursue it against somebody else? So there's questions about the context that go beyond uh, regular analysis that one would do if one is bringing a civil civil litigation again uh, on behalf of clients for other cases. Um, and, and at the end, even after the trial ends and say we are, you know, we win, um, the question is, well, well, what did we achieve? Did we achieve uh, the goals of our clients or does our advocacy need to continue? And so uh, before I jump into the case of Colombia, which I think will be kind of the longer part of, of, of what I tell you uh, in this presentation, I think that um, it would be great um, for me to just kind of uh, take you through our post litigation work in Chile. Um, we represented the family of a very famous singer and song songwriter called Victor Jara. Um, and uh, actually I can stop sharing my screen because this was the very end of our, uh, I don't know how to stop sharing my screen. Um, sorry, you'll have to stare at this because I have if no you idea hit, how to... um, If you go back to where it said share screen originally, there should be a stop share button. Ah. Uh, well, I think I'm just going to just keep talking. <laughs> so I, I'm terrible with this. Um, okay, so I will, um, let me take you through the, the Chile case. Oh, thank you, whoever did that. Um, as I said, we represented the family members of Victor Jara, who was a famous singer songwriter who was murdered in 1973, right at the moment, actually right at the September 11, 1973 coup d'etat in Chile. Uh, he was arrested, dragged to, uh, um, uh, uh, soccer stadium, and he was one of the many, many victims in that soccer stadium. We took the case through, through trial, we won. Um, the, the trial kind of legitimized uh, the version of the story that we thought was, was true. Um, we held uh, a man uh, whose last name, last name is Barrientos uh, liable for uh, uh, murdering, torturing and murdering um, uh, Victor Hara, but really what the families want to see is for this person, as well as any other perpetrators, held accountable in a Chilean court. Chile has requested extradition, but extradition has been paused and we are in 2020 and we are still uh, awaiting uh, for extradition to move forward. So a lot of our work after uh, litigation has to do with sharing information, kind of packaging all the evidence we've collected uh, during trial, which oftentimes is a way um, our, our work during trial and development is evidence is also um, kind of the work of taking evidence that perhaps has been taken in a civil law country and then um, kind of packaging it in a way that a US court would understand. And um, and that often means dealing with evidentiary uh, questions that are not the same in one system and another, and making sure that we're able to bring in as much evidence that is admissible in um, a common law context that um, you know, it, it oftentimes is, we, this is something of, of a difference. You know, we, we will have less evidence admissible than in a civil law context, just because in a civil law context, you have a panel of judges who are experts who make, um, uh, who make, who are the, the 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 finders of fact, 
whereas in the context of, of uh, common law, uh, we have a jury. And so our evidentiary rules are have developed in different ways. Um, so much of our work has been collecting this information, packaging it, presenting it, assisting efforts uh, at extradition, perhaps in other cases, assisting efforts in um, prosecution, perhaps for um, immigration fraud, when people have uh, naturalized uh, as US citizens having denied, um, you know, lied in their N-400 applications. In, uh, another, in other cases, for example, we've been providing and assisting in, in, uh, in the collection of information along with a coalition of advocacy organizations uh, to encourage the US government to bring uh, an extraterritorial torture criminal case uh, against a torturer uh, who's located in Colorado uh, from the Gambia. Um, and so our TVPA litigation takes us in, in different routes because we ask ourselves our question, the question of what is helpful? What are the goals of the victims and how can we assist them? And so in the case of Colombia for us, one of the goals of course was to kind of bring at least one measure of justice, a little bit of a window into the possibility of justice in a context in which the victims had been denied access to information, to truth and justice um, through these um, kind of middle of the night extraditions. Um, it was also a way for us to do some fact finding that sometimes was not even possible in Colombia. So among the things, for example, that we were able to obtain in this case were what are called versiones libres, which are kind of free depositions. And they were part of the agreements, uh, as part of the agreement in the, in the demobilization agreement, um, the paramilitaries provided these extremely long free form uh, confessions of their actions. Um, but they weren't required to turn them over. They weren't public. They were actually um, confidential. And so even though there have been ways to obtain them, um, one way to obtain them here has been through the discovery process that has required uh, the defendant in this case to turn those over. It's uh, in, in other ways in which we've developed information has been obviously there's um, the possibility of us taking depositions here. In the case of Makako, there was obviously the complication of the fact that he was deported uh, before we were able to take uh, depositions. Nonetheless, we were able to take depositions of some of his allies because we obtained a court order in Colombia based on a letter rogatory sent from the United States from a court here. So developing evidence jointly with the partner organization with CSJ in Colombia is, is a key element of our litigation strategy um, because oftentimes it is not just about developing um, uh, Yes, it is about developing the evidence, obviously, to, to prove our case, but it's also developing the evidence to construct and build this history. And so to us, um, the question at the end of this case, and this case in Colombia in particular, is, well, after the case ends, what are we going to do with all the information and all the evidence we've obtained? What, how are we going to make sure that this story is told and that it's told in a way that is helpful for the reconciliation and justice seeking process in Colombia. And so that is um, to me an essential part of our, our, our TVPA litigation is that there are limits if we think of it as starting and ending with the trial or starting and ending with the case. If that is the case, we win a case and if we abandon advocacy after the fact, it will absolutely be just uh, very, very often be just a symbolic win that will not actually reach the goals of the community that was affected and of the victims uh, that we represented. Instead, I think part of our commitment is to continue engaging with these cases long after the case ends to see when is there an opportunity in the home country for us to kind of use the information, use the expertise we've developed um, and assist in uh, further efforts to obtain justice. Because as we said, as I said at the very beginning, um, I think that justice in a foreign court is, is kind of the beginning of, or is one um, 
one way of obtaining justice, but really until you have access to justice in the country where the crime was committed, I think that you will not have kind of an effective um, a way of preventing uh, something like this from happening again. And so I, I leave you with that just kind of as our philosophy of our, and, and our approach. And also, you know, our, uh, I think a, a practice note there is also that it would be impossible for our work to take place if we did not um, partner with national organizations and trust their judgment about what is helpful um, and trust um, their judgment about how we can make our work both during and after trial helpful to their efforts. Because in the end, those organizations are going to be there in the long run. And uh, unless, you know, unless we are uh, co uh, cognizant and, and active in our collaborations, uh, we run the risk of being an international NGO that lands, does a little bit, leaves, and um, you know doesn't have the impact that that we we could have had. So I'll leave it at that, and I'm eager to to hear your comments and questions. Great, thank you so much, both Carolina and Claret. And again, encouraging everyone in our audience to please go ahead and submit questions at any point. Um, we don't have any at the moment, so maybe I'll start actually, Claret, with some of the points that you ended with in terms of the use of evidence, both for its probative value within the specific case, but also that you see the much broader role of evidence in terms of contributing to the truth-telling process and reconciliation, given sort of such a long conflict and the fact that so much information was so deliberately hidden in terms of the violations that occurred, whether extrajudicial killings, torture, disappearances. And so if you could talk a little bit, um, just elaborate a little bit more in terms of the use of that evidence and narrative towards the truth process as well and how that connects. Either one of us or would you like me to? I think for my part, I only have a little, like a glimpse, right? I, we have one case of two victims. And so I can only tell you what we think, uh, you know, uh, we hope to contribute in that case, or even perhaps as we're able to, as we learn more about the, as we've learned more about the impact of, of, of uh, the extraditions, um, there's kind of that larger story. For us, um, you know, during the process of the case, I think one big breakthrough for us was obtaining the, the versiones libres from, from Macaco. Mm -hmm. um, just kind of, these were confessions that he, you know, gave, but he maintained uh, confidential and refused to hand over. And so to have those and to be able to share them, I think that did help in a way to crack a few doors open that even went beyond the specifics of, of our case. Um, in other cases, I think that depositions of the, of the defendants have been really crucial. Um, and uh, ultimately in cases that have gone to trial as well, um, just kind of the, the slew of, of uh, um, witnesses on behalf of the defendant um, often have kind of clarified the, the narrative that the defendants attempted to push forth and uh, the cracks in those narratives. Um, I think that I still have questions about the best format for this because these stories are clear to me and are clear to anybody who is willing to read the e extensive transcripts um, of trials, but we haven't, and we are working on this, just kind of figuring out a way to package this information in a way that is accessible in, uh, you know, in say kind of a memory, um, a truth and memory construction um, instrument. Um, and that is actually, uh, I think, uh, something we still, we still are working on. Um, I would actually say two things, um, especially based on, on what's happened on this case. So because of the nature of a civil suit in the United States and it not implying any criminal investigations, mm -hmm. Um, as opposed to what's been happening in Colombia or that we were trying to achieve at the moment. Um, when CJA came to make uh, to take a lot of the depositions, we heard versions that we had never heard before, especially from allies or people that had worked with Macaco, 
because these were versions that they were not willing to give to a criminal court because they were not willing to um, admit any responsibility that could imply that they would be prosecuted um, afterwards. So the civil nature of the case was very helpful. Um, we actually had these conversations with at least one of the heads, like middle second in command of the paramilitaries, paramilitaries and he said, I cannot be prosecuted for anything I say. And, and we had to uh, explain to him the nature of a civil procedure. Um, so this really was helpful. And then also because of the, not only the nature of the case, but the way that CJA uh, has uh, works in general, um, the um, resources that we have available have clarified a lot of the situations. So one of the biggest examples is even to this day, because this is some of the work that we still haven't done in the advocacy part that Clara was talking about, but to this day, if you talk to the family, they will tell you that he was assassinated mainly because he was building this radio station um, in, in, the, in the community and because he was a local leader. In a lot of the depositions that we took, we found out things that even the Colombian district's attorney's office uh, doesn't know because a lot of the people were not willing to talk to the district attorney. And we found out about this mediation that he was doing between uh, guerrillas and the government to try to establish peace talks. And this had never been disclosed during the criminal proceedings, not only because the DA's office doesn't have enough resources, but because I, at CSJ, I was the, the attorney in this case, and I had on my own docket, I had 54 cases. So the time I could spend um, representing and doing research and very profound research in order to take this depositions is not the same as when the case is taken as a strategic litigation case, the way CJA does. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is really helpful. How we are going to, or how we can bring that information, not only to present it to the family, but also into the criminal proceeding is something that is still, we're trying to figure out uh, between CSJ and CJA. Um, because the evidentiary rules in Colombia are not as strict as they, as they are in the United States. So it is some information that we can bring, but we're still figuring out how that uh, follows if we have to do it through State Department or if it can just be provided directly through counsel. Um, but it has helped a lot, not only because of the nature of the complaint, but also because of the resources available to organizations in the United States. Thank you both. So we have a question from Professor Bradley, whether the Supreme Court's restriction of alien tort statute litigation has resulted in increased use of the TVPA. That's a great question. Um, you know, that has not been my experience. And I think it's because the TVPA has now for a long time been, you know, clearly limited to uh, uh, individual perpetrators. And I think that the, um, it, it, what it has changed is that oftentimes uh, in the older cases we used to bring, we used to bring TVPA claims alongside ATS claims. Um, and so it, it's um, the narrowing and the, especially the presumption against extraterritoriality has uh, potentially kind of limited the number of cases in which we would bring both uh, TVPA and ATS allegations. But for individual cases, um, you know, they, they were they were already kind of principally being brought under the ATS, I'm sorry, under the TVPA. And um, when there were crimes that went beyond, but you know, the TVPA limits itself to torture and extrajudicial killings. And oftentimes there are other very serious crimes, um, enforced uh, displacement, um, persecution, um, uh, crimes against humanity, uh, which may not, you know, may, may, may provide kind of the context, but they're not specific claims or claims specific to the TVPA. Um, so what it has resulted in, I think, is it's just in a narrowing of uh, individual cases. Uh, we don't and haven't worked that much with uh, corporate cases. Um, and I think that those have definitely been uh, narrowed and have, uh, you know, a diminished in number uh, since the narrowing of the ATS. Carolina, would you like to add anything? No, okay. And another question, if there, um, whether or not the TVPA statute of limitations and or exhaustion requirements end up restricting your ability to bring some suits. That is always a, at the top of mind. I mean, we know that these are um, elementary uh, defenses. I think that um, the, legislative history of the TVPA has made it clear that um, 
tolling is to be applied fairly liberally because a lot of these contexts, you know, they, it, may, it may go beyond the 10 year mark, but it may have been that, you know, even 15 years after uh, the violation, there was an authoritative, um, I'm sorry, an autocratic regime that was persecuting um, the victims, right? Or there was no access to information or the perpetrator may have been hiding uh, and we may not have known where he is. And so there's, there's a number of uh, typical uh, scenarios for uh, tolling that um, have, are always, as I said, top of mind at the beginning of, of any analysis of any case. We look at it, we look at when it happened, we look at tolling uh, arguments, and that is uh, part of our analysis of whether we take the case or not. Uh, with color of law, I think the question was to color of law requirements or? Um, so the yeah, statute of limitations and or exhaustion requirements. Yeah, so the exhaustion requirements, um, yeah, that is also part of our analysis. Um, I think that uh, there's uh, courts in the United States have been able to recognize when um, uh, the pur uh, purported uh, options on the ground in the country, the purported um, uh, remedies are actually illusory. And so, um, you know, situations in which, for example, a criminal investigation for um, an extrajudicial killing is take, has taken 15 years and it still hasn't moved forward, even though it is theoretically available, courts have tended to um, interpret those as kind of there, there now is no evidence of, of, of a remedy. In other cases, I think that there's been some discussion as to whether, for example, government-wide um, uh, uh, compensations for victims in general would, uh, would amount to a remedy. And if that has, uh, and if claiming that is a requirement. Um, we've recently, uh, I think that, the 11th circuit at least has found that you that victims um, should claim those those reparations but having claimed them and still not having obtained justice against the perpetrators um, they can proceed with the case and so that was um, i think the last um, interlocutory appeal in a recent case against the former president of bolivia mm -hmm. Um, I would add to that, well, Claret mentioned the color of law, and um, specifically in this case, um, we, we went around how to let the judge know about what Claret is saying, how while the, the exhaustion um, requirement might have not been met because the criminal proceeding was still ongoing, the justice and peace process is still ongoing, um, the time that had elapsed between the crime, which was in 2001, to when we've had uh, our, the first um, uh, ruling of the judge on, on the, the admission of the complaint, which was 2015, if I'm not mistaken, 16, um, was, was longer than victims could rationally expect for justice. And it was, it, there was a lot of work done around that because in the case of Colombia, you cannot say that victims were being persecuted or that there was an autocratic or uh, a regime that did not allow for justice to happen as might have been the case, for example, in Chile and, and in other countries. But also um, I mentioned at the beginning that the case was brought initially in, on behalf of Amarosa's family and Eduardo. And actually the claim uh, regarding uh, Amarosa Jaramillo was not admitted and it was discarded because of the color of law requirement. And this was, this was an issue because um, to this day now we know, and I think back in 2010, we still knew, we already knew that paramilitaries in Colombia, and especially in the region where these two, the, the, these two assassinations occurred, were working hand in hand with government officials. They were actually, uh, had been trained decades before, back in 1980, back in 1990, they had been trained by government officials. And a lot of them had actually been given arms by government officials. But uh, at the, the case, uh, when, it was, when the case was, was brought, the judge, that studied the case found that in the case of Almarosa, there was no evidence of the active participation of a state agent. In the case of Eduardo, it was it was a very minor detail, but his assassination happened 
about 50 meters away from a police station. Um, so the, the judge took that, the, the, the police station, to mean that the police were there, even if there was no evidence of the police actually participating. And uh, our claim is actually that the military was the one that was participating, not the police. But he relied on the presence of the police 50 meters away from where the, the, the crime happened to admit the claim uh, on behalf of Eduardo's family and to dismiss the claim on Amarosa's family. And so the color of law issue when, when it comes to paramilitary groups, and I'm guessing this doesn't happen just in Colombia, but it can happen in a lot of other countries where um, judges and civil courts are hoping for evidence that proves that there was a member of the state at the time of the crime can limit the amount of cases that can be brought because that is not the way that paramilitaries worked in Colombia. Most of it was a background support and not uh, on the ground support. Uh, Clarence, I found it very helpful at the beginning when you sort of laid out the different decision making um, steps that you and CJA's organization go through in deciding whether to pursue a case. So sort of both what victims and their families want, as Carolina emphasized so much as well, and also sort of broad long term accountability goals, goals as well. And you also talked about the fact that you think very carefully through when not to pursue a case. And of course, it's very fact and circumstance specific, but I wonder if you could share with us a little bit about if there are key factors that would lead you to make that decision that it would be more effective or uh, more um, helpful in terms of your, your goals to actually not pursue a case. Yeah, that's, that's a great question because oftentimes, I mean, there is an atrocity committed and we might not, uh, litigation in the United States might not be the best outlet. Um, you might, uh, in the case of Latin America, for example, think of um, the Inter-American Commission, uh, the Inter-American Court, um, you might think of UN forums, um, or uh, you might think uh, of just political advocacy as a means to kind of getting access to justice. I think for us, um, the analysis is always about the viability of the case and then its larger impact. Mm -hmm. um, and so if we think, if we think of our are, um, you know, cases brought to us as something that um, is kind of unique to the, the family and the victims. I mean, we always want to ask ourselves, um, is there a larger group mm -hmm. of, of, of victims that a win in this case might help? What might a loss in this case mean? You know, would a because that that is a background assumption. I'm sorry, I have a, I have a puppy crying here. I'm going to open the door so she doesn't interrupt you or us. Okay. Um, you know, I, I think for us the question is, what might a loss mean? Mm -hmm. uh, would it be a setback in efforts? For example, there might be a delicate moment domestically uh, when there's a potential for. Uh, Kind of creating a truth commission at home or creating a mechanism for accountability or um, kind of finally getting information from the army that has been you know denied for decades is this the right moment to do that you know would a case like this uh, scare people into 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 kind of taking steps back domestically so i think this is why for us it's really key to have a national partner uh, who understands the context, because we could think about the potential impact and how this might be representative of many other violations and how a win would bring, you know, uh, positive um, uh, results for the victims' families. But we need information about what does this mean now, you know, when we bring the case for the efforts of advocates on the ground in the country where the violation was committed. And in some cases, we have heard, go for it, whether you win or lose, this is going to help kind of push uh, um, our efforts because, you know, a trial in the United States will actually have resonance in the country. And in other cases, we might hear something like this isn't the right moment, especially if you lose. Um, and so those are things that we will, we will consider as well, along with the families, of course. And most of the time, what we find is that families are both seeking justice for themselves, but are part of a much broader solidarity uh, group in which they see themselves as part of many other families as well. So um, for
fortunately, we haven't yet encountered a situation in which families' um, interests in, in justice for their family member uh, are at, uh, you know, are clashing with the broader interest for justice domestically. All right, well, we're just about at time. So huge thank you again to Carolina Solano and Clara Vargas for joining us today and to our audience members. And we will look forward to um, restarting our Human Rights and Practice event series next spring. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.